But here he is talking about, this is what I first told you. He's saying, when you first became a church, when you first became Christians, this is what I preached to you. And what I preached was that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. The scriptures, all over scriptures, we have seen where it talked about Jesus. It talked about Jesus coming. It talked about a lot of things. And it says that he was buried. That was Easter, wasn't it? He died. And he was raised on the third day. See, Paul's telling the very same story that we preached on Sunday. All of this actually happened. And it was all in accordance to scriptures, Paul said. And that he appeared to, I call him Cephas. I saw where I was listening to a guy the other day, and he said Cephas. And I'm like, who is Cephas? And he was talking about Cephas. But I've always called him Cephas, so uh, maybe that's... Uh, uh, North Carolinian for Cephas, I call him Cephas. But uh, then he appeared to the twelve. Now this is after Jesus has risen. He, he rose Sunday, and now he's out. People were seeing him. He appeared to people. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. He was talking about at that particular time, though some have died or fallen asleep. And he appeared to James, and then he appeared to all the apostles. Last of all, listen to this very carefully, verse 8. Last of all, as to one untimely born. He's saying, I was born at the wrong time. He appeared also unto me. And here's where he tells you what he is in verse 9. For I am the least of the what? Apostles. So he was apostle. He said he's the least of them, unworthy to be called an apostle. Uh, sometimes we find our callings and things, and we feel unworthy to the calling. But God still called us there. Paul saying he was he was called, but he felt like he was the least, and he was unworthy. Why was he unworthy? Because he persecuted the church. Now Paul done something that I don't think any of you's ever done. A whole lot of people hadn't done it. They persecuted the church. They went and drug Christians. Uh, Paul, when he was Saul, went and drug Christians before the count. He even had some of them put to death. You know, he was uh, part of the reason some people were put to death. But he said, listen very carefully at verse 10, but by the grace of God. Isn't that the way we live today? We live today by the grace of God. He said, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Now, we need more people to be able to say, by the grace of God, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, and it's not in vain. It's, it's, real, it's true, it's real. Uh, he said, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Now, he put himself above these other ones because he had to work hard for what he had done. He was out doing what God had called him to do. And he had to work very hard. Now, I always read that verse and I'm saying, well, uh, Paul realized what was going on and evidently he was trying to catch up. But that's not so. He just said, I worked hard. He said, I knew what God had done for me. I knew the direction God had put me in and that's the direction I wanted to go in. So I worked at it hard. He said, whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. You Corinthians, when we first started this church, you believed uh, these words that I'm telling you. Uh, I was reading this week a book, and it's, this is uh, a book that uh, Max Licato wrote. It's called Six Hours, One Friday. I told you a couple weeks ago it's one I was reading. And uh, so I'm going to do a lot of quoting from his book because I want you to hear it the way he writes it because it's so simple. And think about it while we're while we're going through this, and I'll stop and elaborate on a few things. But uh, one of his chapters is remember. Can you remember when you weren't saved? Can you remember when you weren't part of God's family? Uh, John chapter 20, verse 19 said, On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus appeared to them. Uh, that's how the church started. Max Lucado said this church started as a group of frightened men in a little room 
on the second floor in Jerusalem with the doors shut and the windows locked because they were afraid what might happen to them. They still at this particular time didn't understand what had just happened. Though trained and taught, because Jesus did train them, didn't he? Jesus was their teacher. He trained them how they were supposed to do things. Uh, they didn't know what to say at this particular time. And uh, they, they had been with him for a little over three years now, and here they are sitting in a little room with everything locked down. What, what's their attitude right now? They're afraid. They were afraid. A lot of times we get in the same thing. Uh, they were, would you, would you rather have a group of soldiers that's gung-ho and ready to go, or would you rather have a group of soldiers that's kind of timid and reluctant to be warriors and, and speechless messengers? I'd rather have the type that was gun home, but these disciples locked themselves in this room, and they were sort of like uh, these timid soldiers. He said their most courageous act, listen, I like the way he writes it, their most courageous act was to get up and lock the door. That was their most courageous act. They, they didn't have the courage. They had lost all hope at this particular time. Why? Because they thought Jesus was dead. You know, he was dead in their mind. Uh, you can see these disciples sitting in that little room. They're not paying attention to each other. They're just there. They're afraid. Uh, some of them are looking at the walls. Some of them are looking at the door. Some of them are looking out the windows. And uh, But you know what else they were doing? They were all looking at their heart. They were looking inside themselves. What is going on? What should I believe? What shouldn't I believe? And... Uh, it was a time for self-examination, for them to come out and examine their hearts. We've reached a time in our lives when we sit in God's presence. It's a time to examine our lives, to go through our lives, uh, make sure our efforts are not futile. Uh, they weren't complaining. They were just sitting there. I don't even know if they were talking to each other. They were just in a room, but you know they had to be talking to each other. Uh, when those Roman soldiers took Jesus, what did they do? Max Licato said, uh, when they took Jesus, the followers took off. And that's what they did. They scattered because Jesus told them they were going to. They had just left the Last Supper. They had just left Jesus breaking the bread with them, drinking the wine with them, and saying this is my body and this is my blood and they had just left these things and shortly after that they're running they're scattering because they're afraid what did a lot of them say you know peter was the first one that spoke up and he said i'll die for you what the bible tells us too that the rest of them said the same thing you know they agreed with peter but here's that bunch of uh disciples that's being brave and all of a sudden they had a lot of devotion but all of a sudden they're sitting in a little room and they're broken and they're shattered even when they went to, to garden of Gethsemane we know that they fled you, you know the story that I always tell and it's, it's not biblical but my thing was you know you have 11 people that follows Jesus for three and a half years and they'd scatter and they see Jesus being arrested but I think they watched from different places different angles whether they were hiding behind rocks or hiding in a crowd I think they were watching people do to Jesus what they saw I told you that in the sermon about Thomas you know how did Thomas know he had a nail scored hands how did Thomas know he had nails in his feet and a, and a pierced side because it had just happened. And he won't with these people in that shut room the first time either. But uh, that's why he made the comment that he wouldn't believe unless he stuck his hand in his side. Now, how did he know he'd been pierced if he won't watch him from somewhere? But uh, here's a man that they had been following for three and a half years that uh, called himself God in the flesh. And that's exactly what Jesus would. Uh, don't you think when they were sitting in that little room, and everything had happened, and they're sitting there in that thinking period. Uh, don't you think that they are sort of self-examining their hearts 
and what could we have done different or he we did exactly what he told us he was going to do we run from everything so they couldn't get this off their mind that's something that don't just leave you that don't just leave you uh maybe they thought when they scattered they could just forget him lose him in the crowd but i don't think so um i think as Max Lucado wrote, listen how simple this is. He said, this is what they thought. He said, if they saw a leper, they thought of Jesus' compassion. If they heard a storm, they remembered the day that he silenced one. He said, if they saw a child, they would think of the day that he held one. And I've got this highlighted. And if they saw a lamb being carried to the temple, which they did every year, they would remember his face streaked with blood and his eyes flooded with love. You can't forget him. When you get Jesus in your heart, you can't forget him. What he's done for you and what he's done for me. And this is the way that church started, this group. They started, they were a bunch of frightened men in the upper room. That's where they started. And a good place to start the church. And that's exactly what they were doing, even though they didn't know at that particular time they were doing it. Uh, how many churches today find themselves in that paralyzed upper room? Sitting there staring at the walls, staring at the ceilings. Uh, might as well have the doors locked. A lot of churches in the United States today are like that. Uh, preachers that I talk to, uh, all churches are in bad shape right now. It's, it's a time for, it's time to move. How many congregations just have, listen to what he says, he said, how many congregations have just enough religion to come together, but not enough passion to go out? The upper room. That's what I wanted you to remember tonight, is that upper room and what it meant. It's actually the first church, even though later on, we found, or we, earlier we found in the book of Acts, you know, that they, they named the first church, and that was the first church. But I'm thinking about this little group of men right here. They got, they got religion. They got passion. They got a little bit of everything when all of a sudden Jesus appeared before them. Here he was. Doors locked, windows locked, and there's Jesus right before them in a body, not a ghost. He was in a body. He was in his glorified body. He ate with him later. He could eat and he could drink. We're going to have that glorified body one day. The question here is, what are we planning to do? Are we going to be just like the men in the room with the doors locked and the windows shut? Or are we going to be uh, ready to go the way they were when they saw Jesus. I don't think there's anybody in here that's accepted for Jesus in your in your life that has accepted him as your Savior that you can't think back and remember that day that uh, that he came into your life. I was 10 years old and I still say I wish I had the pew that I was standing in because we were having a revival and I know it was a five night revival and for about three nights when they have the invitational hymn my fingerprints was dug into the pew in front of me. I was holding on so I could so I wouldn't take that step to the aisle. But I will never forget the day that I let go and I stepped out in that aisle. It changes your life forever. You never have that feeling again uh, that you have that first time. So what are we planning to do? Are we going to stay confused? Do we need more training? Do we need the Holy Spirit to move better? Do we need to pray about it? Uh, picture this scene. He says here, Peter, James, and John. What did they do? They came back, didn't they? The other disciples, came. they came back. to the, If they scattered and now they end up in the room, what did all of them do? They came back, didn't they? They came back. They were still looking for, for some forgiveness. But the main thing is that they came back. And then Jesus told them four words, and it was the best four words they had ever heard coming from anybody, and he said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, uh, picture this. What would have happened if Jesus came in and started arguing with them? 
you know, about y'all scattering. I told y'all we're going to scatter and start fussing with them. And, no, that's not the <laughs> Jesus that we know today. Jesus has got more love than all of us sitting in here tonight have put together. He said, peace be with you. You can be at peace now because you know I'm alive. And you know I'm going to my Father in heaven, and if I go to him, I'm going to come back and get you, and I'm going to take you there with me. But uh, these apostles would never forget that. It put something in them, and they appeared again eight days later, same, same place, this time Thomas was there. And he appeared again with the doors locked. I don't know why they had the doors locked and the windows locked eight days later when they had already met Jesus. But they went to the same place, same scenario, and he appeared again. Then they had a story that they would never cease to tell. They were ready to go. They were ready to go out. You know the statement they made in John where they says, we'll die for you, we'll be willing to die for you. Peter said it, and they all agreed, and that's what exactly what they did. They all ended up dying because of their belief of Jesus Christ. Now, do you think even one out of 11, do you think that it even crossed their mind that uh, I, I'm not going to die for this man? No, they knew that man died for them. They were going to take this to all the ends of the world. Jesus said when he was leaving, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's exactly what these men did. They went out and they preached. And they preached the same thing that Jesus taught. They preached peace be with you. They preached love. Uh, same things that Jesus had offered them. So it tells us that they went back to Jerusalem with great joy. And praising God. If we could get our churches today in the United States to quit worrying about politics and start concentrating more on what did Jesus do for me? Now let me go tell somebody what he did for me. <laughs> let me tell them the life that he has given me. And the main life that he gave you and me is eternal life. That we get to spend time with him in heaven. So here's a transformed group of disciples, even Peter. A few weeks later, Peter made the announcement. He said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. There's none above him, none above him. They weren't short on their words, were they? They went out, they were brave. They, they turned from that scared crowd in that little room to some very brave people, and they went out and they spread the word, especially the one that said that he was the least of them all, uh, one untimely born. He said he was saved too late to be one of the first 12, but Christ converted him anyway. Christ knocked him down in the street. Very miraculous, and he became a follower of Christ. Isn't that, what, isn't that what people do when they get saved? They're on that side with Paul and then when they get or Saul and when they get saved, they're on this side with Paul. But did Paul sit around and do nothing? No, Paul went out and he preached that word. He wrote, he preached, he opened churches. He went back and talked to those churches just like he did these in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But Peter brave Peter. He's really brave now. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified and this same Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And that's what they preach. They preach Jesus crucified. That's what we should be doing. What unlocked their hearts? That's your last question tonight. What unlocked their hearts? They saw Jesus. He appeared, they saw Jesus, it unlocked their hearts. And after that, it was, let's go get them. And that's the world that we need today. We need people like today. Uh, let's go get them. And we're gonna stop right there. Any questions or comments? Dr. Jimmy, would you dismiss us? <coughs>
Y'all have a good week. Huh? No, we don't have that this week. Yeah, we got. I've got that. Uh, I meant to tell y'all too. Y'all pray for me tomorrow. I got my stress test tomorrow. So it's gonna be about. Uh, I think we figured it's gonna be tomorrow, next week, and the week after. We're gonna have like three weeks off before we start it back. She was like this, and uh, got through the service. I want you to baptize me. I think I said, how do we're how's this going to work? So I told you, she said, how am I going to do that? She said, I'd like for you to, I'd like for you to baptize me.